Right now on The Real Story, we introduced you to her Republican challenger, now meet the incumbent. Johanna Hayes sits down with me to talk about why she thinks she deserves a third term in a fifth district race that's on the national radar. Plus, with primary night in the rearview mirror, campaigns are setting their sights on the general election. Did we learn anything from August, and what are the matchups to watch in November? I'm sitting down with history and political science professor Michael Ferguson. All right, good Sunday morning, everybody, and welcome to The Real Story. I'm Matt Karen. She's ahead in fundraising, but tied in the polls. With just about 90 days left, national party influencers are descending on Connecticut, both to try and keep the 5th District seat blue and to turn it red. I'm joined by now two-term incumbent Democratic Congresswoman Johanna Hayes. Johanna, I appreciate you being here. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So let's jump right in. This is sort of an exciting race. Uh, let's talk about how close it is in 2018. You won the 5th District with 56% of the vote, 55% in 2020, but your district has slightly favored Republicans when it comes to gubernatorial races. And recent polls done by some Republicans have it as a toss-up, but are you worried? Are you worried? Well, I think it's very important that you add recent Republican polls have it as a toss-up. I'm not worried because whether the polls are out there or not, my intention is always to work hard every single time to make sure that I communicate my message to the voters and my constituents. And I've delivered. You know, I've gotten some really significant wins in the last four years that I've been here, well, close to four years. So getting out and talking to people about that is what I plan to do. Well, like what? I mean, what's your elevator pitch to voters? Well, everything that I said I would do, I did. You know, um, historic investments in public education, food security. I am the chair of Nutrition Oversight and we have done some tremendous work on food security. There's going to be a White House conference on hunger for the first time in 50 years that I spearheaded. Um, I have eight pieces of legislation that was passed under two different presidents. Just talking to people about having delivered on the promises that I made uh, in 2018 and reminding them of that. Uh, your opponent has tried to label you as a rubber stamp uh, for President Biden. The website GovTrack has your political ideology among the top 10 most liberal House members. Uh, are you too liberal for the 5th District and how, how, do you, how do you define yourself? Are you a progressive Democrat? Well, I vote exactly the way I promised people that I would vote on the issues that we talked about, on the issues that I ran on in 2018. I haven't strayed from those issues. So no, I don't think I'm too liberal. Um, my record matches what the people in this district have asked for. In the middle of this pandemic, I had people reaching out to me, my business is going to close. I can't have access to health care. My kids need, you know, I need mental health services, all of these different things. And that's the way I legislate it. I think it's very important to note that while uh, my Republican challenger often talks about percentages, he never talks about the actual votes. You know, the fact that I voted for the American Rescue Plan. I voted for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I voted for the things that people in this district asked for. So I'm very proud of that record and I stand, up, stand by it. Um, Johanna, as we sit here today, uh, families across Connecticut, as you know, are trying to figure out how to pay for gas, food, prescription drugs, child care. Uh, do Democrats bear any responsibility for the level of inflation that we're seeing here in Connecticut and across the country? And what do you think needs to be done to get it under control? Well, I think that we need to remember that we were in a global pandemic and all of these things, the supply chain disruptions, everything are not just affecting the United States and Democrats, it's around the world. But as an elected official, as leaders, absolutely, we bear some responsibility and it's our job to address these issues. I think it's equally as important to note that when Democrats put up, you know, price gouging for gas, Republicans voted against it. Just recently, I mean, this week we voted on the Inflation Reduction Act to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. Republicans voted against that, you know, and really have tried at every turn to obstruct that path. We have, we Democrats have really operated in a way that is legislating directly towards what people need and not big corporations. But as an elected official, absolutely, my responsibility is to say, okay, how can I be a part of the solution and what do we need to do from here? Um, a very direct question for you. If President Biden chooses to run for re-election in 2024, will you be supporting him? I am very supportive of the president's agenda because 
this week alone, I mean in the last couple of weeks, legislation for veterans, and those June, uh, the Bipartisan Gun Safety Act. We just passed legislation to uh, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. So this president has had some amazing wins. In 2018, under Trump, we were supposed to get infrastructure uh, passed, which was decades in the making. No one could get it done. So President Biden did get that done. I'm very supportive of his agenda. To your question, I'm going to wait to answer that because Republicans are still running attack ads against me from 2018 because I waited on the speaker's race before I knew who was running. I'd like to see if President Trump former President Trump announces. I'd like to see what's going on so that I have a better, a clearer picture of the landscape. But why wouldn't that be an automatic yes? I mean, he's a sitting incumbent president. If he chooses to run again, why wouldn't it be an automatic? I support, support the president. Him? Make no mistake. I, just, I support Would you uh, vote for president. Him? Would I vote for President Biden? Yeah. Yes. So you do support I have him. voted for him, and I would vote for him again. I'm, I'm supportive of the work that he's done. Okay. All right. I mentioned uh, in the beginning how you were ahead of your opponent in fundraising. So speaking of money, uh, when you first ran for office, you were very quick to renounce the influence of corporate political action committee contributions. But since then, you have accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, from corporate PACs, and I was wondering why. Well, when I ran in 2018, when I announced that I was running, I'd never run for public office and I didn't realize that corporate PAC or PACs conclude teachers unions and uh, employees who pay into good government funds like I did all my life. I'm a person who would have never been able to max out to a political um, campaign. So recognizing that this is money that comes from employers, it's tracked better. I mean, you know where it's coming from more so than you do some of these large donations. And notably, no Republican has ever, at least that I know of, has said, I'm not going to take corporate PAC money. So to try to run a campaign and run a race against... But you said it. You said it and then you didn't do it. I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. So I am very careful about where I take money from. So I take from employee unions. I take money from um, from corporations. But it does not affect my voting in any way. Okay. Um, also, staying on the topic of money here, the Federal Election Commission records show that you've paid your children thousands of dollars over the course of your time in office using campaign funds. Uh, I should mention it's not illegal to do that so long as your family members are providing legitimate service and the pay is of a fair market rate. Uh, so can you explain, you know, what your kids do for your campaign and are you at least worried about the perception of nepotism? Well, it's not illegal, and I'm not worried about the perception of nepotism because I have hired them to work on my campaign, and they have worked on my campaign. I mean, any, everybody knows right now it's so difficult to hire campaign staff, and I have consistent staff who have worked on my campaign. My children have worked on it. This has been raised over and over again. I'm not worried about the perception because I haven't done anything wrong, and again, it doesn't affect my work in any way. It's not illegal. It's not anything that I ever have to be worried about. And I'm not the only elected official to have hired um, members of my family. It's, it's prohibited on the official side, and I would never hire someone from my family on the official side. But again, it's not something that I'm worried about. Okay, uh, I wanted to give you the opportunity to clarify something you said a couple of months ago. You explained why you think you got elected. And you said, and I quote, there's this idea that the only reason I got elected is because white liberals felt super sorry and guilty and voted for me. So just give them any other African American and they'll vote for this person all the same. End quote. So, I mean, was this, was, that's, it, no. was that that's, insulting that's, to your constituents? Was that not the right quote? That, well, it's quoted, but it's taken directly out of context. That Put was on a context. meeting and I was sharing what was shared with me. So I was repeating what someone had said to me, and that's been said over and over again. It's been said publicly. It's been put in comments on my social media. And I was at a, I believe it was a Democrat meeting we were having, and I was repeating that. So that wasn't me describing how I got elected or why I got elected. That, that was said to me. The only reason you got elected is because you're a black woman in this district. That do you believe that? Absolutely not. I got elected because I did the work, because I continue to do the work. 
not once but twice. I've had two very successful campaigns. It's more than the color of my skin. It is me having the lived experience, having walked in the same shoes as many of my constituents, caring about the issues and working for those issues. I got elected because I did the work. But as far as the part where you said putting up some other African American, you were referring to your opponent, George Logan. Were you reducing him to a racial identity? Absolutely not. What was that sentence for then? I was repeating, like I just said, I was repeating what was said to me. All right, um, you know, what do you think can be done as far as education goes? Because we're about to start a new school year. There's a lot of apprehension, first of all, because of COVID. And second of all, uh, because we, we've seen a lot of high profile mass shootings here in the United States. So what's your message to students and teachers as we head back for a new school year? Well, um, Democrats made the biggest investment in education that we've seen almost in history. Connecticut received over a billion dollars specifically for education, so providing the resources and the wraparound services so that school districts can do the work that they need to do. But also supporting our teachers, you know, making sure educators have what they need in order to go back in the classrooms and stand in front of kids. As far as mass shootings, I think, again, I have introduced legislation to just identify what a mass shooting is so that the CDC can begin to track and research it, which has been rejected by Republicans. Um, any conversation about helping to make kids safe in schools is rejected. I have been firm in my commitment and voted for it over and over again to reduce the incidences of school-based violence and make sure that kids feel safe in schools. What do you think can be done to make up for not uh, only the learning loss that we've seen, but the real and measurable social and emotional damage that was done? Well, I think that's part of the work that we've already done. So we have put it, made investments for, uh, for tutoring, for wraparound services, for summer programs, for after school programs, for, you know, healthy meals, for mental health. Um, uh, uh, mental health uh, services for kids. So all of those things, when we talk about schools and what it takes for kids to be successful in schools, it's a combination of everything. It's the intersection of having safe housing, their parents being secure, it's kids having a healthy meal, it's you know childcare, all of the things that families need that we have delivered on. And that's what I'm going to remind the voters of. That's what I'm gonna to talk to people about. Um, it's not just about the physical structure of what happens in a school building. It's making sure that when kids show up to school, they're ready to learn. And two quick hitters for you because we're running out of time. What, who is the person in your life who you admire the most? Who I met, my husband. Why? Because he is so incredibly supportive of me and he prays for me and keeps me grounded and reminds me that as long as I stay true to myself and have integrity, that you know he's there for me and he always has been. And what are you most proud of doing during your time in office, if you only had to pick one? <laughs> and uh, what is one thing that you wish you could have done differently? Well, I've had eight, eight pieces of legislation signed into law that I'm very proud of. You know, three pieces of veteran legislation. I just had the Access to Baby Formula Act passed in record time under under two weeks, had legislation from drafting it to having it on the president's desk for signature. But I think more importantly, I'm most proud of my constituent services. I have people who have never reached out to their congressperson who call my office and they feel like they have access to this process that they feel like they were locked out of. That was very important to me, to make sure that everybody in all 41 towns felt like they were represented and not just a small majority you know, in some high turnout uh, communities. So, that I think is what I'm most proud of. When I go to the grocery store, when I'm walking, you know, in downtown Waterbury, and people say, "I reached out to your office. I didn't know who else to call, yep. and I was able to get help." That that I think is why I went to Congress, and that's why I think I deserve to stay here. Congresswoman Johanna Hayes running for re-election for a third term here in the fifth district. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks Thank very you. much. All right, coming up next on the Real Story, breaking down the bitter battles ahead as the campaign set their sights on November. What did we learn from the primaries, and what influence will the national political climate have on the big races. I'm sitting down with the political science experts.